First, I've got to say that as I was telling my teenagers I was coming here to speak at Google Zeitgeist, they were like, whatever. They really couldn't care less until they found out I was going to be hanging out with Nick from GoPro. That's important to teenagers. And yes, some of that footage was GoPro, and we use it all the time. It's absolutely epic. You know, look at that, that video there for a minute, and it's like, wow, how did this happen? Um, it's like the Talking Heads, Talking Heads song, Once in a Lifetime, How Did I Get Here? And I must be probably the least educated person in this room by far, right? I don't even understand why the light goes on when you flick the switch. I have no idea how GoPro works, but I think I have an instinct, a consciousness of um, why story, stories connect. You know, I, to make it even more ridiculous is how I even ended up in America. I mean, I was in the parachute regiment in a special forces team in Britain. That's all I knew I'd do was carry a gun around. A little bit of a different gun than Morgan's gun, by the way. I think my gun beats your gun in that way. Um, but I was going to, you know, come to America. And my original idea was there were, I knew there were jobs in Central America that this guy, Oliver North, was sourcing foreign soldiers to go and fight in Nicaragua. And as I was leaving the airport at Heathrow, my mum said to me, only child, do you think you've put us through enough? No more guns. What are you going to do in America? And I lied and said, it's going to be a security job. I lied. I knew that I was going to meet someone, try and get this job in Central America. And she said, looked at me in the eye. I said, promise me, no more guns. And I got on this Pan Am flight in the last row of coach, thinking, what the fuck am I going to do in America? I've got $200, no work visa. And I arrived. I knew one friend who was working as a chauffeur in Beverly Hills. This guy I'd known since I was seven years of age. I called him from LAX. Couldn't even figure out how the payphone worked. I'd never seen an American payphone. Um, and I reached him. He said, where are you calling from? Like, Middle East. Where are you calling from? I said, no, no, I'm in LA. I need somewhere to stay. Um, I've got to find a job. He said, you're lucky. The people I work for are out of town. I'll pick you up. Just wait there. And Nick shows up 45 minutes later at LAX in a brand new Lamborghini. I'm like, Fuck, America is good. <laughs> Went back to his house, and I said, dude, I, I can't do what I was going to do. I couldn't even really explain to him what I was going to do. I said, you know, I, I, I've got to find a job. He said, get a job like this, like a chauffeur. I said, how am I going to find that? He said, well, let's look in the newspaper. He looked in the LA Times, and there were no chauffeur jobs. There was one job that had all the attributes I wanted, which was like live in, car, $125 a week. There was only one catch. It said child care. And I said, Nick said, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, you're a commando. You're not going to get a job as a nanny like Mary Poppins. I said, dude, desperate times. I called up to 624 North Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills and got myself an interview that night. I arrived at 2 in the afternoon in LAX with no, no work visa, no nothing. At 6 o'clock, I was in Beverly Hills in interviewing to be a nanny. And this gruff guy, like in his 50s, with his younger wife, um, <laughs> and all these Central American women in uniforms are up for the job. And I was thinking to myself, boy, they must be really glad I'm not going to take the original job. Um, anyway, this guy calls me in. I walked into this enormous living room the size of this with these paintings on the wall, nothing like I'd ever seen in my life. And this guy's like, who are you? What are you here for? I said, I I'm Mark. I'm here for the, uh, the childcare job. He said, childcare? I've got a three-year-old with her, a 17-year-old and a 90-year-old from a previous marriage. How old are you? I said, 22. He said, like, I need a 22-year-old, another kid. I want someone to take care of the kids. And his wife was like, uh, uh, calm down, calm down. Let's be courteous. Where are you from, Mark? I said, London, ma'am. Oh, London. We love London. <laughs> the husband looks at her like she has three heads. And he said, I'll take over. He said, you know, we're a wealthy family. You can see that. And there's a reason for that. This is not just childcare. Yeah. Can you clean, Mark? I said, sir, I just left five years in a British Army unit. They came around with a white glove to check my locker. Can I clean? I'm a great cleaner. His wife says, see? Then he says, you know, laundry. I'm like, once again, laundry? 
You see the way the British Army dress? I could literally iron your shirt with a crease so sharp you could shave with it, sir. <laughs> but then he got me. Can you cook, Mark? I said, sir, I'm British. My mum can't even cook. <laughs> I walked outside. This is completely true. Nick sitting in the Lamborghini, which I still is a surreal experience, right? And you know, I had a bus pass back in England. I'm in a Lamborghini. Um, and Nick said, you get a job? I said, no, no, no. The cute young wife would have definitely given me the job. It was the older husband. He was not going to have anything of me moving into that house. He's like, OK, let's go get a beer. But later that night at 10 o'clock, Pat, the woman, called the number I'd left at where Nick's house was. and said, can you, go, can you start tomorrow at 10 AM? Day two in America, I became a nanny. And my first job was empty a dishwasher. Now, again, I'd never seen a dishwasher except for my mum. <laughs> Every cabinet was exactly the same. It took me ages to even find the dishwasher. But that was it, October the 18th, 1982. That's how I started, and which makes it even more ridiculous. I've got all these shows. And it is true. It is true, especially in the last year. A lot of number ones. I actually don't really know what I'm doing that much. But I do have instinct. I think, you know, everyone obviously here has consciousness and instinct, but consciousness is the one thing science obviously can't explain. It can't explain light, and it can't explain consciousness. Like the two things that have no mass can't be explained. But I also, I'm probably so dumb, I don't actually understand how the systems work to get the stuff on YouTube or how Google operates. Or anything. But I do know all the geniuses that do that. It's worth nothing without content. So it creates some value that we both need each other, obviously. Because if, if people can't create good stories, then certainly the pipes that people are creating in this room are of absolutely no value, because you're going to watch a blank screen. And people get to choose whatever they want to watch. It needs to be good. You know, openness is something that America is so brilliant. I mean, going from a nanny knowing nothing. I learned so much, by the way. One thing I learned in that nanny job, even though they were really wealthy people, I knew they weren't really any smarter than me in terms of instinct. They were educationally smarter, but in terms of instinct, they weren't that smarter. They taught me, they did, they taught me a lot of things about pricing. I mean, one day in that nanny job, Irv, really rough guy I worked for, really rough on me. He came in one day, and it was a Friday, and he said, open the fridge, how much that milk cost? Now, I'm the one doing the grocery shopping, right? I said, I, I don't know, sir. How much do these tomatoes cost? I don't know. He said, do you not understand the value of knowing pricing? Meet me Sunday morning in the kitchen, and we're going shopping. That was my day off. I come in, and he's brought in all these coupons that he's cut out of the LA Times and takes me on a shopping trip to Gelson's, where his wife had been sending me to buy the groceries, and then took me down to a cheaper shop, Alpha Beta, to compare the milk and the tomatoes and all the pricing and the value that we saved $36 with these coupons that this guy is worth about a billion dollars has cut out, spent hours cutting out. But I did learn so much from that um, in America of knowing the value of pricing and, and what value means. In what we do for a living, it's like one massive rejection, going and pitching shows and people saying no all the time. But even to me, honestly, people think it's easy. But you've got to go and pitch shows. There are certain truths that work. And if you look at, well, these are things I've not really said um, that publicly before, but you know, I do think of the emotional connection that I am responsible for, which is through this little box, right? I do not have any idea how it works called a TV or a flat thing on the wall these days that we're sending into someone's living room. So, as making TV, more than motion pictures, like I speak to Brian Grazer, a good friend of mine, in a moment, one of the best motion picture producers on the planet Earth ever. And people go into theaters and watch that. But it's only invading your house when it's on television. So it's a responsibility of invading someone's house. If you think of things like Survivor, people think, OK, just a show on an island, which is, by the way, last year is 26th season Survivor beat American Idol in both uh, total viewers and the young viewers, the sort of demo. And that's all of that storytelling. You know, 
people always ask me, are you going to change Survivor this year? Are you going to change the voice this year? I think, why would I change drastically something that's really, really working? People feel the need to always tinker with and change what's working. It goes back to me coming to America. You know, I remember, you know, my mother who's since died, you know, and, and I think that there was a mailbox on Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills. I remember that mailbox for getting, sending her letters and then receiving letters would come in. And we had handwritten letters. And there's always something comforting of knowing people tend to use the same stationery over and over. Same handwriting, the same stamp and the postmark. And there's something anchoring and comforting. The only thing different, right, is when you open it, what's written inside. And I approach my shows in that way. The reason I don't make massive changes on my hit shows, the people are expecting this anchoring feeling, emotional connection, when they turn on Survivor, or The Voice, or Shark Tank, or The Apprentice, or Fifth Grader. They're expecting an emotionally anchoring, familiar experience. It's like the, the envelope, right? When the envelope comes, when you, you know, it's still nice to get handwritten notes, all of you googly people, it's still good to write handwritten notes. But when you open it, it's a fresh letter inside. And so I make slight changes in my shows each season, but I don't change the envelope ever. Um, another thing about Survivor on a storytelling level, you know, I'm sure everyone in here knows about Joseph Campbell and Monomyth. And if you don't, you really need to read Hero with a Thousand Faces for sure. It should be, seriously, in terms of knowing story and not know this work, you won't, it's a thing that will hold you back terribly. But one thing about that is death and rebirth. And so if you look at how I took Joseph Campbell-esque feeling into Survivor, think of what Survivor is. Survivor is a thing where we throw 16 people on an island, never met each other before. We've got to work together, otherwise they're going to starve and freeze and get too many bug bites. It's an awful experience. But even though they can work in collectives together, they have to get rid of someone every week, right? And the whole end game is, the very people you've got rid of are the very people that will grant you, if you're part of the final two, a million dollars. So the people that you dumped or fired or executed, however you want to look at it, are coming back to give you the gift of a million dollars. So if you fuck people over too badly in the game, you are never, ever going to get that million dollars in Survivor. That's the, the moral there. But a deeper sense is, how do you get rid of people? So I decided that most um, sacrifices take place at night throughout history. And there's reasons that your subconscious, your awareness is, is, is lowered and you're more open and fearful in dimly lit rooms. It's a very brightly lit room. It's harder to control people. So if you think of many institutions that do things in dimly lit rooms, it's because you're controlling people more because their resistance is down in a dimly lit room. I knew tribal council had to be at night. I knew that I only wanted the feeling of firelight. So when these Hollywood genius lighting guys lit it, I felt like I was on Yankee Stadium. And I was like, whoa, no, no, no. Turn, turn the lights off. Then there's not enough light for the cameras. And I said, turn the lights around. And let's bounce the lights off trees. So it's just ambient light. And I want everything to feel like the fire. Because the orange firelight is a warm color. It's a feeling of life. So they go into tribal council. It's lit by firelight. It feels warm. It's life, because the tribe is still alive. Someone is then brutally gotten rid of. It's nearly, nearly always a blind side, because it's hard to trust people in a game like this. And then someone will be voted out. And Jeff Pros will, will say, the tribe has spoken, will snuff out their flame, because their flame represents warm and life. So now the flame is gone, and we hang on that shot. And Jeff will then immediately say, it's time for you to go. And they'll naturally leave, because it's low light. They're in a, a vulnerable situation, and they will do what they're told. 99 times out of 100. Then immediately, though, my music bed changes to funeralistic. And my lighting, as the camera shifts around, is cobalt blue. And we never obviously mention this in the audience stuff. It just people feel what I'm saying. Because blue is a death color. And someone has been basically executed. They've been voted out, but in, in historical terms, they'll be killed. Jeff will always mention what just happened, what have you learned, and then the most important part of it. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. Because that tells them the tribe, while changed and has lost someone, 
it will live on. And there will be life tomorrow. And it'll be living anew and they'll start again. And it's, that is a key sense of why people are with Survivor. That's why the audience has never left. We moved from Thursdays to Wednesdays, didn't lose any audience. Last year, crushed American Idol. There's a reason why shows, if you look at The Voice, and what was it with The Voice? When my kids said to me, Dad, you're insane. Who needs another singing show? We have American Idol, we have X Factor. This is mental. No one's going to watch another singing show on an already crowded lineup. And anyway, I thought, Dad, you said that you're into kindness and you want to do the raising up and spread light, consciousness and light. I said, I do. So, but all these shows are humiliation shows. American Idol and X Factor, their whole shtick is to bring on a deliberately bad singer who thinks they, they're deluded and rip them a new one to make them look bad for TV. And that's what you said this family doesn't do. I said, no, we're not doing that. On The Voice, everything will be uplifting. So my kids, they're smart. They've been in this business a long time. So what's the hook? Always needs to be a hook. Think about the hook on The Voice is. Everybody likes the little guy to rise up. So what The Voice has, because it's very nature, the blind auditions, four superstar singers who've always had, since they've been stars, things easy, right? They don't have to ask for anything. Everyone brings them everything. They get every deal they want. They're superstar, multi, multi-millionaire singers. But in this game, once they've pressed their buttons and they've turned around more than one, the power shifts to the little guy. And now you see multi-millionaire superstars who are now fighting and begging an unknown to join their team. And that's the unspoken consciousness that America, why America likes the voice. We all want to see the little guy succeed. And we're really sick of seeing the likes of Simon Cowell criticize little people. We just are. And you know, if you look, move on in the last year, like something like uh, the Bible. The Bible, that was a huge undertaking. It took four years, and many people told me that's career ending. A couple of reasons, Mark all these so-called conventional wisdom smart people, that, first of all, no one cares about religion, really. You know, it's just nutty people in churches. On TV, no way it's going to work. Um, and, and, and secondly, it's a subject that people don't want to talk about, and if you get it wrong in any way, your career is going to be over. You know, I was so strong in my instinct to bring the Bible to television, and I felt that, Personally, I feel the Bible should be taught in public schools, not as a religion, as, as a literature document. You know, it's obviously more important to our storytelling, the Bible, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, for storytellers, the intrinsic stories, than anything. Shakespeare quoted directly from the Bible 1,200 times. Um, you've all read, obviously, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 100 direct quotes from the Bible in there. You look at some of the language we have. The first time the words white as snow was ever said was in Daniel in the Bible. The writings on the wall. You know, I could go on and give you 100 quotes from the Bible that are in everyday language. But I took it on. But there's something. Why did the Bible do so well? In America, 100 million viewers, and they would add another 100 million viewers globally. And we're only about 20% of the way distributing it right now. Number one selling DVD in the history of television DVDs. Because I approached it so lovingly, authentically, in an uplifting way. Revelation, uh, sorry, Genesis to Revelation, I believe, was a story of God's love for all of us and not giving up on us. So I approached the storytelling in that way. Um, not as um, a threatening story, but as an uplifting story. And so I did, which... Not, it's not been mentioned that much, but it's been online and people have noticed it, that I, I had people look at the whole Bible who were not, didn't have a religious feeling, hadn't been religiously trained, people who went to Oxford and Cambridge, and my whole team was in, in Britain, and just say, just look at this objectively. What's going on here? What is, what is this book saying? And how, so how do I make 10 hours? And it came back over and over. This is a prophecy fulfilled. This is a prophecy book. 
Um, and I thoroughly believe in the Bible, but I said I'm not saying anything sacrilegious. Like the way that Lord of the Rings is a prophecy book. The Bible is obviously, and Lord of the Rings wouldn't be created without the Bible. There wouldn't have been Lord of the Rings without the Bible, obviously. It wouldn't have been Matrix without the Bible. But it's a prophecy fulfilled. So that Jesus was hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New. So therefore I had a dilemma. I knew I had to have a scene with the, the voice in the burning bush, and I had to have a scene when God meets Abraham. And therefore, if you took this book, there's only one person I could show as God. It would have been Jesus. Very, very controversial. I did that, took off like wildfire because the authentic opening of Genesis showed that when he comes to meet with Abraham, there's two angels, there's, there's the Lord and two angels, and I showed that as Jesus, which had never, ever been done before. But instinctively, I felt the authentic storytelling had to be correct. And living authentically and knowing that you should never over, overthink things, just take things as they are and tell them, has paid off for me in the way of Survivor, The Voice, that's a, that fifth grader. Why fifth grader work? Because everyone here who's got kids knows that when the kids are 10 years of age, you cannot do their homework. You just can't. You've forgotten those basic things. You may be geniuses at work at great big companies, but you can't do your 10-year-old's homework anymore. And a show, like fifth grader, which showed that the questions were all fifth grade and below, and bringing on really smart UCLA law school grads who couldn't answer fifth grade stuff while the kids could, raised up the kids and made nice fun of the adults in a nice, loving way. And that show went to 58 countries. But it's going with small ideas, but being authentic and, and loving about how, and I know my, time, my time's up, I could tell you so much more about how I think, but um, as this is about storytelling, I would say the biggest thing I can offer lovingly to all of you today from storytelling, you really should read and really think about Joseph Campbell and Hero with a Thousand Faces because if you want to try to tell stories, it has to be done instinctively and there isn't actually, even if you follow the formulas, it doesn't mean you're going to have a hit. Otherwise, every movie Brian Grazer did would be a hit if it was that easy, but it's not that easy. So there's got to be an instinctual storytelling feeling into it but there are certain signposts, and Joseph Campbell, I'd say, is, in terms of storytelling structure, the most important signpost. Hey, thanks for listening.